So those folks out in the other room didn't hear me, uh, but uh, Michelle will, and those will remind them for sure. Um, but two weeks from today, on June 5th, there's going to be a pro- promotion Sunday. Um, so we will be introducing all the teachers. We will uh, have uh, you know the, the, the children that will be going up from you know one class to the next. Um, so it will be. Uh, I guess just we call Sunday School, Children's Church, Children's Ministries, um, Promotion Sunday. So that'll be two weeks from today. Um, but since we've only been going for a few weeks and it's been a little sporadic as far as, you know, who's coming, who's not, and different things that, um, and it's been a couple of years. Um, so we just wanted you to know that that was available uh, for you as well. We'll draw further attention to that on the 5th. Um, Joshua did mention Tom and Barbara Ward coming. It'll be next week. Um, They will be here. Uh, Tom and Barbara will present their ministry during the adult Sunday school time. And at at that point, I also invite, uh, you have the week off. We'll have the the, the younger, the older, our young adults join. Um, And then Tom will give the message uh, next week as well uh, during this time. And uh, so, and, and we're going to provide a, a potluck for that in order to just be, have some more extended time with them. Uh, they are, they're retiring after like 34 years. Yeah, this church has supported them the entire 34 years, so it's, it's a big deal to celebrate together with them. Um, also, we are still, um, you know, it, it's really strange. The, kind of an unfortunate thing, I mean, you know, the two years of, 
of COVID protocol really has changed our world. I, I really do hope that slowly but surely over time that that will diminish. But one of the things that it seems to have changed is, is every time it's something like, we're going to do this, you know, sign up or come see me about it. Um, you know, there used to be tremendous response to that. Even last summer when we were still sort of in COVID, when we had the neighborhood outreach on one of those, I had 20 volunteers signed up. We didn't have enough for, for yesterday. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is, is even Cuba. And I, I realize that that's not for everybody. Um, it's this Bible smuggling operation that has been going smoothly. They go over at least twice a year, every year, um, and bringing encouragement to churches. So I, I, uh, I intend uh, indeed to go and to join with Don Lindsay. He's been leading these trips for a long time. Uh, and uh, invite, you know, it's kind of like the, the first two or three, up to about three. We're going to go only as a group of five. And we're at two right now. So the first three, how's that? The first three of you who rush and sign up or come and see me and ask more about it and want to do that. It's going to be some, about eight days in the first half of October. We can set those days ourselves. It's totally flexible. Um, there is an application process, uh, however, with Vision Beyond Borders. If you want to look into that further, you can Google that. Vision Beyond Borders. Um, really one of the small missions operations on the planet for whom I believe is just, you know, operated and run in a, in a, in a particularly uh, good manner, way in which they go about doing things. Um, and I did make some little reference to the outreach. We're, we're going to, in order to have enough time to gear up to try and do it again, it is now slated for June 11th. That's, I believe, three weeks from today, or is it only two? No, it'll be three. Um, and we're going to try it again, but I need to have everything set by May 29th, a week from today. Um, we'll have that set, or we'll, it's put off till July 30th, because that's the next available weekend if we... And, and, you know, I would just hope folks would want you know, it's a time for you to hang out with each other. It's barbecue and games and um, meet your neighbors, mingle with your neighbors. Um, uh, you know, there are, there are a few folks here uh, today that are directly related to those activities last year. So we encourage you uh, to, to, to come. You know, I know I'm, I'm, a, I'm really excited about it. If it's something that is a church as a whole doesn't, you know, I, I can't force it, and I certainly can't do it alone, but I would invite you to come alongside on that. Uh, well, let's pray as we get into uh, the word today. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord God, I, uh, I thank you, Lord, that you give us so much that you encourage us with. Sometimes you can to convict us, to strengthen our faith, to encourage us, uh, to just you know be the lifter of our head, to give us hope. Um, all kinds of good things, Lord, and we're looking. We want to see Jesus and uh, help us, Lord, today to yet see even more. Uh, of Jesus as we sort of journey through the tabernacle. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and my apologies today, and a personal apology to one of our first row guests that I thought for absolutely sure I had sat down and I was just going to get all the scriptures into our display and life happened. Um, so we're still not there. Um, I particularly wanted to get the supporting text because if you turn to Exodus 25, the big chunks of scripture that we'll be in will be in Exodus and in and around uh, chapter 25. Um, there are some other supporting texts that I will read. Um, but you know, 
The last study that we looked at was the outer court, okay? Because there's basically there's the three courts and the tabernacle. The outer court, which is uncovered, and it's open. And it's open to anyone at the time who was a you know, faithful covenant Jewish person. Uh, and then there was the, the holy place, which we come into today. And then, actually, I'm going to split that up into two parts. And Bob's here next week, so the week after that will be the second part of the holy place. And then... Uh, the Holy of Holies, uh, the third and final uh, aspect. And it just gets, even as those terms indicate, just holier and, and even, you know, it can be a bit scarier. I mean, there's just a sense of the, of the awesomeness and the glory and the holiness of God as we approach further there. But remember last time in the outer court, everything was bronze. Bronze, 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 everywhere you look. There's a bronze altar, the bronze labor. As we leave the outer court, however, it's emphasis, in the bronze being an emphasis on judgment and sacrifice, we move into the holy place where there's no more bronze. Uh, everything's gold and acacia wood. Acacia wood covered in gold. Uh, the three objects that are in this room give us greater insight into the different aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they also show us what's, record, what's required to kind of take the next step from, uh, from salvation to fellowship. Because the outer court's about salvation. It's about redemption. It's about sacrifice, the bronze. And, and then we come into fellowship. The, the, the holy place is about fellowship of being close to God and in his midst. Um, the first object that we encounter into our way into the holy place. Let's read that. It's, it, it is in Exodus 25 and beginning in verse 23. Exodus 25 and beginning in verse 23. Make a table of acacia wood Two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim, a hand breadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood. Overlay them with gold and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. The bread of the presence. Uh, so as we move into the holy place, it's the first thing that we encounter. It's otherwise called the table of showbread. The bread of the presence. The table had 12 loaves on it, representing the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Leviticus 24, 5, 9 tells us that the showbread was made of fine flour and set on the table, sprinkled lightly with frankincense. And it could be eaten only by the priests and, and were to be replaced, whether consumed or not, replaced weekly. Uh, and notice where I said it was available to priests only. Then and now that the bread, Jesus, and, and, and given that there is the priesthood of all believers, the New Testament concept of everyone in Christ is a priest, meaning we have that access, that then only the priests, and then sometimes even just the high priest, we have access to that bread. We could feed upon Christ. And just as a reminder, in 1 Peter 2, 9, you know, it tells us that he, Peter writes that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. This was first said in the Old Testament of the Jew, and now he's writing to the church. 
You are a chosen pre- people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. So you, so you see, actually, there's, there's identity and purpose there. Uh, your identity is your chosen race, a royal priesthood, etc. Your purpose, declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, that's something that should really be spontaneous in his people, really, because of what he has done in us. And just as the ancient priests of Israel would continually minister in the tabernacle and feed upon the show bread, so we are to do the same in this age. Our bread is Christ. Our bread is Jesus. So... That's what the picture of bread is. Now, you know, you could ask a question like, what, what is the bread a picture of? And you could pretty much, when you're talking about the tabernacle, you could probably just kind of like shout out Jesus to just about any of those. You know, I remember like when we were, I remember once, a long time ago, teaching some little kids and, and you had all these questions, you know, and, and sure enough, the answer to almost every question was Jesus. And so one of them kind of caught on to that. <clears throat> and it would just be an immediate and just Jesus, you know. And anytime in Sunday school, it's almost like that's, that's, that can always be the default answer, right? Um, but uh, and that is very much uh, the case here. Um, and so, what is this, how is this table construction? It's acacia wood with gold overlay. Acacia wood representing Jesus' humanity, the gold his divinity. Uh, but the specific f- emphasis is on Christ as the bread. There's the table that's wood and gold, but then there's the bread. That's on top. And we know that, that without a doubt that Jesus is the bread and the bread of life repeated over and over again in the New Testament. And um, one point in John chapter 6, and beginning at verse 32, Jesus says himself, he says, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He is the bread of life. You cannot live without him. You can have physical life, but not genuine life and not spiritual life and not eternal life. He said then, uh, they say to him then, sir, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Uh, You know, I know that in my own life, when spiritually I feel weak or I feel hungry or thirsty, you know, it's because I haven't been. I haven't been feeding on the bread enough and drinking of the water of life without cost. Enough, you know, it has to be. Very, very regular, large portions um, to drink deep and have his life in us, flowing out of us. So we are to feed upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one reason the scriptures were written. You know, he is the word. He is the word of God. He is, we, we encounter him there. We feast there. Uh, It's also one of the key roles of the Holy Spirit uh, to embrace the Word and to know Him and to know Him more intimately. It's even what we're doing right now, isn't it? We're studying the Word. We're we're having a a spiritual meal um, looking at and and feasting upon the Word of God. Whether Exodus or John or anywhere else, all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching and reproof and instruction of godliness. 
Paul wrote to Timothy. So that we do. And when you think about how important bread is for physical life, I mean, bread is the staple food world round. Um, and various grains. Um, and yet God has designed so that we need much more than just normal food. You know where he says in, in you know, that famous line in De Deuteronomy 8, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And and, and not to say that I've, I've, I've got this figured out exactly, but I'll present it this way anyway. I used to think that what that meant was that we do not uh, live by, you know, physical bread alone, but by, you know, devouring the word of God bread. And, 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 and I, I believe that's, and that is true. That's just what we were talking about. However, sometimes we go to something that we are familiar with, and we make it the interpretation. And then sometimes we miss, maybe, what this text or any particular text might be saying. Though that's proper teaching, it might not be the interpretation of this verse. I think the, the, what the meaning of this verse is that we live by the, 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 every utterance of, of, the, of the word of God. That meaning that we live because God says so. We live on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He speaks life and we live. So in a sense, really, even with the six billion or seven, whatever it is on the planet today, uh, within that unimaginable Godhead, the reality of his presence and who he is as almighty God, which we can't even begin to fathom, he is simultaneously speaking, live to each one uh, of us who yet live. Uh, but we must, we cannot live or have life apart from him. And so really, in, in, in what, you know, better source, what better to, to live on than that which tells us about Jesus, um, who is the bread. That's what we do at the communion table as well, right? He's the bread. He says, this, this bread represents my body broken for you. He's the bread. At communion, we, we remember Right? It's all about remember. We're brought to that place where we remember the cross, which our sin required, and so that's really depressing. Then we remember that he said, do this until I return again. And then that, you know, brings us back. Uh, but I think we're intended really to experience all of that. Uh, the grief of the weight of our sin that the very God of the universe took and endured one of the most horrific experiences ever known on our behalf and and to you know to remember that and not just remember it academically you know just oh yeah it's true but it was it was me and you. We, we, we required that. And then we remember that he says, do this till we come, till I return. And he's the lifter of our head and he restores us back. And, and then everything in between, you know, and then everything since. Um, in our own personal lives, just to remember. We oftentimes revisit that concept when we share in communion together. So as you look around the holy place, the next item that takes our attention is the altar of incense. Exodus 30. You can turn to Exodus 30 for that. The altar uh, of incense. Exodus 30, and right at verse 1. 
<clears throat> Bob Rowe, you're up there. Could, Bob, could, could I get... Did you turn this fan on high for me today? I'm just really running warm. Got to cool the engine down. All right, thank you so much. Let's read in Exodus chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, cubit long. I've read this word cubit over and over and over and over again. I mean, a, a cubit was measured by basically the elbow to the tip of the finger uh, of the average adult male. Uh, roughly like 18 inches, you know, half a yard. Here's a cubit, by the way. Um, so it's to be square, cubit long, cubit wide, two cubits high. Um, its horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top and all the sides of the horns with pure gold. And make a gold molding around it. Make two gold rings for the altar below the molding, two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry. You've noticed that every single one of these items has poles, has these rings and poles to carry it. Itself is not to be touched. We'll, we'll get to that. Tuck that away for a while. About the, it's not to be itself touched, but each one was given a means to carry. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Put the altar in front of the curtain that is before the ark of the testimony, before the atonement cover that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. So he's talking about back into the Holy of Holies. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when, the light, when he lights the lamps at twilight. So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. So the altar of incense, again made from acacia wood and gold. The humanity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus. The altar was used by the high priest for the burning of the incense every morning and every evening of every day. Again, I think they're indicating perhaps more than this, but I think just superficially, I think we can notice what that means in terms of every morning and every evening. And Scripture talks about waking up in the morning and, and embracing God and, and Scripture, and it shall always be before me. And then in the evening... At a bare minimum, and, and, and obviously all kinds of different things can happen throughout the day, but this morning and evening, every day. Do you know what incense is a picture of in the Bible? Anybody? Not Jesus? <laughs> no, it's prayer. You're right. Yeah. So it's prayer, okay? But here I think it's it's. It, it, it can symbolize the prayers of Jesus before the Father, or it, it represents the prayers of the saints more commonly. Um, yeah, but this time, you know, you can't just blurt out Jesus every time. You'd still be pretty close, and, and we wouldn't wrap your knuckles for it. Um, but it's prayer. Aaron had to offer incense morning and evening each day. Uh, so in what way does this, the prayer then in the incense picture Jesus? If the incense pictures prayer, how does the prayer you know, re re relate to Jesus? Aaron was the high priest. A picture of Jesus who is the eternal high priest, right? Priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The one that has no end. It lasts forever. He, he became the final and last high priest. So all things really ceased under the old covenant when Jesus fulfilled them. He becomes the lamb that now is slain once and for all, not every year. Uh, he becomes, you know, the high priest, not where there would be one who would make that sacrifice annually and many other duties. But he is the final one. He's, he, he is, of course, the perfect one. The only one who can fulfill it all. And, and it's, it's, it's perfect and eternal. So that way it's a picture of, of Jesus, our high priest today. As Aaron offered up incense, 
prayer intercession. It's a picture of Jesus' work. See, the first thing I thought of, I always think of, you know, because we see, we encounter that phrase in Scripture, the prayers of the saints. We see it in Revelation and elsewhere. Um, and so my mind kind of went, first went there, but then when you have the connection of Aaron the high priest and he would do this, then I think it's picturing Jesus because it says that he, he intercedes for us at the right hand of God. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7, 24 and 25. Jesus, on the other hand, in contrast to, to, to the other high priest, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. The writer of Hebrews makes a big, long, difficult to follow, honestly, argument about Jesus' priesthood uh, um, and that, that relationship to Melchizedek. In all my study through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, that portion of Hebrews has always been the most difficult for me to, to just, I think, really wrap my brain around it, really follow it, particularly, maybe, you know, to teach it, to articulate it in a way somebody else can get it. It's, however, he, in this portion, he, he talks about how he continues forever because he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Since, okay, here it is, he always lives to make intercession for them, or he always lives to pray for them, to pray on their behalf. Jesus is constantly interceding for us to the Father, because there's only the one man between us and the Father, the Lord Jesus. Not human priests, nobody else. But Jesus, we, we are priests and need no priest to intercede for us or to be a go-between. Jesus is the one man who is that go-between as our high priest. Just as they have many priests and a high priest, we are the priests of God. Scripture says it. It's nothing to boast about. It's a beautiful reality to rejoice in and, and marvel at. And, and Jesus is our high priest. So the brazen altar in the outer court, remember, speaks of sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus that provided salvation for us and all who believe. And the golden altar in the holy place speaks of the present work of the living, resurrected Christ who intercedes on our behalf. You see that progression. He's our sacrifice in the outer court. That can't go any further. Okay? If you do not accept the, the sacrifice of Jesus in the outer court, you will not have access to the holy place or the holy of holies. So we first, we must be redeemed, forgiven, uh, our sins atoned for through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now we have access into the holy place, which is nearness to Christ, and, and it's, a, it's about fellowship rather than about salvation therefore he's able to save to the uttermost as the writer of Hebrews says uh, Jesus he prays for us you know I, I think one of the coolest there's just this little passage in the gospels where um, you know Peter's really struggling with Jesus being you know dead physically Right? And there's that whole thing about the, you know, the cocks crowing and him denying and all this stuff. And he's really having an existential crisis. And Jesus really ministers to him. And in Luke 22, 31, 32, he, um, or in Luke 22, 31, he says, Simon, Simon. The other, the other thing, way in which he referred to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Okay? He knows Peter's weak and he will get us. He will attempt. He knows when you're weak. He knows when you're weak. A little digression here, but you know that G I don't believe Jesus can read your mind. I don't think demons and all that kind of stuff can read your mind. But Satan doesn't have to because He's been, he's been alive as a being for thousands of years at a minimum. 
and certainly through all of creation history. And he has studied human psychology. He has studied human behavior. He has studied you. He, he knows that look, you know, when you sit back in the chair and you just kind of, you know, you're, and he knows when you're depressed. He knows when you're anxious. He knows when you, you know. And so he pounces when you're weak. So he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But here it is. But I have prayed for you. So Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, with little old Simon, he's, you know, he's no different than us. He's really struggling. He says, man, I know you, you are weak right now. And Satan has is, is, is been wanting to just pour it on. But I have prayed for you. That little phrase right there. But I have prayed for you. So personal application, man, really think about it. Whenever you're in a spot, okay, it doesn't matter what it is. You can remember this. Man, it feels like right now I am in the wine press. Man, it feels like right now I am just alone and in the desert. It feels like right now, I mean, this life is not good. This is tough. This is so difficult. I just don't know. Jesus whispers, but I have prayed for you. And each and every single one, okay? Everyone can personalize this. He's, he's your Lord and you are his kid. As he says, I shall be their God and they shall be my children and they shall be my people and you are his precious daughter, his precious son. And he will pray for you. He will pray for you. Our high priest will never fail or let you down. He says, I will never disappoint. Every human being will disappoint you. Everyone. Okay? No matter how you know, great it is, it seems at the moment, you know, it's like, no, never put that person on a pedestal. Um, you know, they, we will, we will disappoint. But Jesus says the perfect high priest is the perfect everything. There's so many ways in which we can define and describe him. He will never let you down. Okay. Now, I want to give a little taste and preview of what comes next week. Uh, turn to, back to Exodus 25. Back to Exodus 25. Take up where we left off before at verse 31. <clears throat> And the last article, the third article in the holy place is the golden lampstand. And it is amazing. Uh, the description is like, wow. I mean, when these craftsmen, because remember he said he gave the craftsmen by the Holy Spirit, this, this you know, Holy Spirit led ability to do their amazing craftsmanship. The description of this is unbelievable. It's like, you know, movies are made about, you know, finding the ancient treasures. It's like, you know, like the Holy Grail is one and, and, and other art, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, right? The, 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 the whole seeking after the Ark of the Covenant because that's in the Holy of Holies. And, and man, if, if, I mean, it's worth j just in gold alone would be millions. And, and, of course, in its antiquity, and then, of course, its relationship to Almighty God, it would be, you know, we could put no value on it. Even when we look here, there's, there's a, there's a um, it talks about using a full talent of gold. And a talent weighed about 70 pounds. 
And, and I'm not sure if it's this article here. But there's one, and I think it might be this one, but there's, one, there's a piece of furniture in the tabernacle that's made out of an, a talent of gold, which is 70 pounds of gold, which would be, oh, this, this is in the notes for next week, but I mean, it's just millions, okay? Just in this one piece, of its value today. Uh, but let's look at this, this, just meditate on this description. Exodus 25, beginning in verse 31 to 38. Make a lampstand of pure gold and hammer it out. So this time, no acacia wood, pure gold. Hammer it out, base and shaft. Its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand. Three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch. Three on the next branch and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and branches shall be of one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. So this is to be fast. I mean, ju just the remarkable thing ability that, that, and, and manner of manufacturing this thing. One chunk of gold, all that we just described in all of its intricacies. It shall be hammered out of pure gold, one piece. Then make it seven lamps and set them upon it so that they light the space in front of it. It was the only light in the room, by the way. The seven lamps that would be put on the lampstand. And there is so much that we can see, and I think not stretching it at all, but that we can, that we can, throughout this intricate description, we can see varying aspects of the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's fascinating. And we'll see that um, in a couple of weeks as it will be. Well, let's pray. <sighs> Father, I thank you so much that uh, you you are our our sacrifice in the outer court. You are the one who has become this sacrifice. And then as we enter closer into fellowship, you are our high priest. You intercede for us. You are there for us. Uh, you are the bread of life. You are the, 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 the incense, the intercession, the prayer. You are also as we shall see the light. And so much more. Take us past the outer courts. And to the holy place. Take us into the holy of holies. Mm. Thank you, Lord. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Uh,
There's a few of you who are really praying for me right now, and I appreciate it because um, even though I, I, I wanted to, I guess I want to share some of the things I'm going to share with you. I really, even even weeks ago, um, being at this place and at this time, it's 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 awkward and it's um, it's bittersweet. Um, but let me just not hold you in suspense for too much longer. Um, uh, and somehow there's been, I mean, things leak, I guess, and there's been some rumors and stuff, but I, I'm going to be retiring. Um, and uh, I, I, will, I will be here through the end of the summer, the end of August. Um, and... I, I, this time has, had come much earlier, much sooner than I, than I thought it would. When I, when I first came here, and I remember it so well, man, when we had the congregational meeting and Michelle and I were asked to, you know, to, we went down to some friend's home just a couple blocks away, and we barely got there, and the phone rang, and come back, and the vote is in, and... and uh, and Humanity Baptist Church requires an incredibly high threshold on a vote for their senior pastor, 90%. Um, it actually was like 70 to 1. And, you know, of course, your mind immediately goes to, who's that one? You know, who's the one, you know? Well, after the first few months I was here, there were like three that were a candidate for that one. Um, but... Uh, Man, we came back in this room, and I know it wasn't, it, 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 you guys had, had barely known us. We'd been here, you know, since September. We'd mingled and preached and talked and had meetings and Q's and a, Q&A's and all kinds of stuff. And had an amazing Q&A that day. I mean, you guys really pressed me on some difficult things that day. Um, but when we came in the door, I will never forget. I was really one of the most blessing, I mean, just, just amazing, wonderful, warm, cozy, feel good, penetrate your soul moments because this place just erupted into a cheer like we had just, you know, won the championship. And it just blew us away. And I know that it was, it was, had to do with the fact that, that you know, a, a pastor had been appointed and had, um, had seen God's will to come and that you had seen God's will to say yes. And, and uh, it had little to do with us personally, but was uh, a huge blessing nonetheless. And, uh, and at the time, I really thought that, you know, it was going to be, oh, I don't know, you know, nine years or so, given kind of my age and given the fact that we wanted to have plenty of time left to do missions and, and we knew that Michelle's parents would need us at some point. And, you know, so I sort of kind of envisioned that we would be there through that time. And, and we made it at least over, over halfway. It'll be right at about five years at the end of August. And, um, but there, and the, the reasons being, and here this is extremely important that you know this, that it isn't, um, because, you know, I was in Montana for 21 years. And that really could have been my only place of ministry. It was going as good as ever when we left. But we've felt Almighty God say, you are going to leave this beautiful, comfortable place and go to the city where the people are. And we didn't want to find out what a Western Montana version of the belly of a big fish was so we obeyed God and we went to San Diego for five years that was intended to be temporary because it's a church plant and we came here and we really I did we saw this would be our last place of full-time pastoral ministry um, just didn't think it would be quite this soon 